Okay, so we can call the meeting to order at 4.06 p.m. Let's see if I'm, if I'm in, yep, okay. So we can call, and I guess the first thing, I did not send out the minutes. So um, are we okay with tabling the minutes? With me. Hello? Yeah. I thought we, we saw that. I saw I thought I saw I'm sorry. No, you out. Can we... Didn't we get the minutes back in the end of April? Maybe I was looking at the wrong minutes. We did get the minutes, but uh Cheryl, I, I don't they were a long time ago. Yeah. I think like April 26th. No, I think Laura did send them. So I didn't send them out with with uh well maybe she did send them. I'm sorry. So okay, well. If you didn't can get a I chance a to review that to approve the minute. I, I can do that. And I second. So are we are we are we approving the minutes or are we um, tabling them? I think we have a motion and a second to approve. And, okay. Um, I just put them up favor. here. Yep. Oh, I'm in favor. Aye. Okay, so looks like it passes unanimously. And I am just pulling up the first item on our agenda. I'm trying to go through two. Um, Chairwoman items. Harris. I'm so sorry, we, guys. We had a, a special request. Yes, ma'am. We had a, spe a special request by the specialized instruction department uh, because of another meeting that these folks have. If, if we could swap the special education referral numbers report for the first item. Is that all right with you? I'm sorry, Denalda, can you repeat that? Is it okay if we take agenda item special education referral numbers report first? because the specialized- Oh, that's perfectly fine. Okay, great, awesome. Yep. I am, I'm going to commence the sharing of my screen because the, this group of fine folks has shared their presentation uh, and, to put, and to put it into our bigger presentation. One second. Okay, great, share. Okay, um, let's see, let me make this much bigger. Okay, so, this, I'm going to defer to Yvette and Stacy uh, Heiligenthaler on this referral numbers report. Um, our original request was to look at, at some disaggregated data around students who are referred for special education services. Um, Yvette and Stacy, the floor is yours. Please let me know when you'd like me to switch slides. Thank you so much, Donalda, and thank you, Sherelle, for accommodating the request. So I know um, as- No uh, problem. Thanks for thank putting you. this together. I appreciate it. So thank you, Sherelle. So I know as a result of a report that was made to the now standing subcommittee of special education, um, subcommittee of curriculum and instruction, there was a discussion about referrals to special education. I want to um, provide you with lots of data um, and assure you that there is a year's worth of data that Dr. Fergus has been doing with individual schools. And I, I want to put this in perspective of the balance that I've heard for the past four years that there are parents in particular that are very concerned that referrals for suspected disabilities are not occurring and that there may be concerns about child find and balance that with the district's very, very strong commitment to the SRBI model and not using what I call an environmental disability, that is the environment's inability to respond early to a child who may need additional interventions. So as we talk about tonight's um, presentation and I provide you with this overview, that is the balance that I urge um, us all to consider. 
So this represents the past four years data of initial referrals, PPT1s for suspected disabilities. As you can see, last year and this year, there has been a decline. I believe that decline is artificially related to COVID and school closings and um, the, the hybrid of instruction and recognizing that the district is looking at opportunities lost for all kids. Um, the yellow um, is this year's data. And again, I caution you, it only goes up to May 1st. Um, we still have two more months there. So as you can see, um, in um, four years ago and last year, there were 600 plus students initially referred for the first time uh, for a suspected disability. Next slide, please. We've provided for you and disaggregated for you by school. Um, you will see by race as, as um, was requested by the committee and also by ethnicity. So here are all the elementary schools, same four years. We see the same pattern of this year's um, dip Although you will note that in some schools, um, last year's referral rate and certainly the referral rate in the previous two years has been um, elevated. And I think that is due in large part to some of the work that we've been doing about um, child find and ensuring that children suspected of a disability are referred. Um, I often say, and I'm I did not make this up. Um, I'm quoting <coughs> Julie Weatherby, you know, when in doubt, evaluate. When there's debate, evaluate. Um, so this reflects at least two years ago, that shift around child find. Here are the middle school on the next slide. I'm sorry, Yvette, just to jump back. Go ahead. Um, Kendall seems very much like an outlier there, right? Uh, it is, and well, not completely for this year, um, but certainly from um, 2017 and 2018. Um, <clears throat> and I know that that prompted um, a discussion about ESY numbers as well. Mm -hmm. as, I, as I said, Dr. Fergus has been diving very deeply into this. So I could either say, and remember these are raw numbers, not percentages. So you need to look at school size as well. Um, <coughs> um, I think it is um, necessary to have deeper discussions and presentations about um, what the outliers are. And then second to that, what the SRB um, processes that could possibly account for that. Um, so you're correct, Erica, obviously um, there are outliers here. Next slide is the middle schools. And again, in the midst of all of this decline, we do see some elevated numbers for last year in both of our middle schools. And then here are the high schools. And again, some outliers here. I would expect to see very reduced numbers by the high school over time as we begin the SRBI um, implementation and we catch kids earlier in the referral process. But nonetheless, um, you see the numbers were quite elevated, particularly in 2018. And that is consistent across the district. 2018 was consistent. Um, we asked, uh, we were asked to provide information by ethnicity and then by race. So Stacy is going to talk about the next two slides. I'm sorry, before we jump into that, just to sure. go back a couple of slides. Overall, I think what I heard you say was that there was a drop because of COVID. But this then year I, and last year, go, this if year and last go back year. a little yep. bit, district-wide, there was a drop. If you look at the first slide, district-wide, we see a decline in 2019-20 district-wide by mm -hmm. approximately 150 children. Right. And then this year, another decline 
Again, um, please view that yellow data with caution because there are still two months left to the school year. Um, so district-wide, there was a decline internally, not every school declined. Right, so when I look at four and five, I okay. heard a lot of things were elevated. So what was on the decline so significantly to offset all of those elevated numbers? Well, if you look at 2018-19, which is the yellow, uh, the orange bars, mm -hmm. in all but two of the elementary schools, those were the highest referral rates, in some cases twice uh, the amount of other years. Um, and then if you look at the high school slide number six, mm -hmm. that, that year accounted for 70 at one high school, which is quite an elevated number. Okay. Okay. And again, without digging deeper and asking the school leaders to present individual conversations with you, the question could be raised, what accounts for it? The hypothesis could be, remember in 1819, we were welcoming many, many students into our school district. We had an increase in the total N of enrollment. With enrollment comes increased referrals and suspicion of kids in need of um, specialized services. Um, clearly, I gave you my hypothesis about this year and last year. Can I also add something, Yvette? When Please, we look at these numbers, um, so we need to take into account at, at the elementary level, NECC. So some of the older numbers accounted for school, children were at schools. And so the referrals were part of the school process. And so as we look at even some of the like 17, 18, those might've been the first year students were, they were at the preschool there and then, you know, they moved into the school. The other is that as we've expanded our preschool evaluation and identification, there are less students being identified at the elementary level because we're getting them at their threes and fours as opposed to kindergarten. So, you know, for we've done a lot of outreach of come, come to NECC, you know, if you have any type of suspected disability, we're working with our community providers and the referral. And so with that, students are being identified at three and four and not waiting until they come into kindergarten being identified in kindergarten in their first grade. So that does account for some, at, especially at the elementary level, not all, but some of the decline. Um, in terms of the evaluation. And 1718 was the first year um, of full implementation of the new multidisciplinary assessment process at any at NECC. So I think you see that um, in, in those first two years as well. I would suggest that preschool child find evaluation and service delivery is a topic unto itself. Um, and we would certainly be happy to prepare that information. We did not include it in this information. Um, we focused on the elementary, middle, and high schools. And when we see variances as significant as Nathan Hales, on the mm -hmm. following slide, is that, you know, obviously Dr. Stray is working hard to, to, um, to, inf to infuse some new SRBI um, resources into the district. Do, do you prioritize, you know, going into next year, or even at the end of this year, evaluating or assessing what's behind these significant? Um, I, I think the date, uh, Erica. I think the data. That's the charge of the data teams. Okay. Um, and the data team process is a um, a very significant focus of the new strategic operating plan that that we've been discussing all year. Um, I gave you four years worth of data because any one data point is simply that and it does not tell you trends. So if all we looked at was 2019-20, you would say, hmm, you know, what's happening? Why, why does Nathan Hale appear to be referring the most 
or reversely, why does Kendall appear to be referring the fewest in that year? But again, you need to look at trends um, and the discussion has to be embedded within child find and SRBI. Mm -hmm. Okay. So on to the ethnicity and race. Um, so here we have um, our slide based on um, ethnicity. So you can see um, with our Hispanic population um, versus our non our non Hispanic or non Latino, uh, the initial PPT rate um, amongst the amongst the um, the different groups. Um, I know that that's something that um, you wanted to take a look at. Um, you can see that they're primarily um, equal in terms of um, they're very similar numbers um, in terms of the referrals. 2017-18 um, was probably the, the biggest discrepancy of about 40 students, um, but there there is um, an equal in terms um, of uh, referral rates with that. And Sherelle had asked for information about over referrals and under referrals, and we'll talk about prevalence mm -hmm. rates um, at the last slide. Um, when we look at ethnicity and race, we need to put it into context of the, the general cohort um, so that if, if a mm -hmm. particular subgroup is 25% uh, of the total district, um, you know, Dr. Fergus has worked with us, and I know he's done several presentations for the board, how to determine through a formula about um, disproportionality. Um, so again, we're presenting you with the numbers, but it needs to be reviewed in terms of what the total um, subgroup is um, within the district at large. Right. Okay. So I'm looking the one that you have on the screen now. This is breaking it down, you know, into the subgroups. The other one just broke it down into Hispanic and non Hispanic. Um, so, you have a chart. So um, Hispanic and non Hispanic is reported as ethnicity, whereas okay. all the other subgroups are reported as race. Got so it. what we attempted to do in this chart is give you, for example, those families who self-identified as white and Hispanic or non-Hispanic. If you look at the last four bars, for example. Okay. Okay. Um, the other numbers are, you know, except for the Black or African American subgroup, the other subgroup is is quite small. Um, and typically we're looking for ends of 30 to be able to do any kind of statistical analysis. So mm -hmm. what this chart does, it attempts to show you the, um, the, the um, both, both reports, you know, both subgroup, general subgroups on mm -hmm. the same chart. Um, no, this is good. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Stacy, did you want to say anything else about that? No, not that slide. Okay. Um, this slide is, shows where Norwalk is in comparison to the state special education um, prevalence, prevalence rate. I'm going to try to say that. Um, as you can see, Norwalk has stayed um, pretty consistent. Um, we've gone up a little bit from 13.7 to 14. Um, the state ha is having um, a bigger jump. Um, and I know that they're, they're looking at that. So um, it, just because the state has a higher preva prevalence rate, I'm really having trouble with that word today, um, doesn't mean that we're under identifying um, students. It means that the state overall is going up, but nationally and even within similar districts, um, our, our, the number of students we're identifying is, is on target. And if you mm -hmm. go to the, the next slide, Donalda, um, the state looks at our data in terms of what they're, you know, are we over or under representing any group? 
And the only um, disproportionate representation that they've identified was our overrepresentation of black students as being um, identified as intellectually disabled, um, starting back in 2018-19. Um, they're looking for a, prevail a prevalence rate of 3% or less. Um, so we were overrepresented in 1819 and 1920. However, mm -hmm. with some work, and I'll talk a little bit about that, um, we did get that below that 3%, which is the 2.64. Um, so we, when we identify or the state identifies a subgroup that we are over, that we are overrepresenting, or if we were underrepresenting, because they, they can take that into account as well. Um, we did a, a real deep dive and we did an individual file review for every mm -hmm. student that was on there to look at you know the data. So we went back um, and looked at the evaluation reports, was the process followed to look at were there any discrepancies in, in any of the students' file and in the identification. And anything that we notice, um, you know, it's like you start once you start going in, um, you know, you find different things here and there. So even if it might not have affected the identification, if we notice, you know, there might not have been a checklist um, done or we, we noticed we couldn't find a rating scale. We went back and I say we, uh, Maureen Sullivan and myself, we spoke with each of the school psychologists that were part of that team to talk about the process of, of going forward with identification. Um, so, you know, we really take, a, take that over or under um, representation seriously and really looked at how, you know, what are our district practices and what is it that we need to do and then going back at the school level and working with, you know, we started with the school psychologists, we met with them as a group, we met with them individually, um, we met with some of the school teams so that they really knew what we were looking at and what the, you know, what the root cause was in, in that overrepresentation. And so when Tracy, we, before you go on, can I, I'm sorry, is that I just want to ask a quick question. So in the other, in the race chart, um, it, it's glaring that the African Americans was really, really high. Um, and then I guess the state is saying that we're overrepresenting. So how do we know? Um, so like, if, if I, are we putting together something that we can look at that's consistent across the board? Because I wonder if the f fidelity, when it's like, okay, we're overrepresenting. Okay, okay, but now we're not. Let's get our numbers below. I don't want to look at it or perceive it as that way. Like we're playing a numbers game. So how do we? Um, do this with fidelity. So, so the, I'm if, sorry. Yeah, if I if I can if if I can for a minute, I think that is the work of the data teams led by Dr. Fergus's discussions. He is um, leading them to look at that um, very carefully. And as Stacy said, if if you go back to the the slide 11, we were very concerned. Um, not, again, not so much about the referral rates, because as I said, when there's debate, you evaluate. You, you want to be sure that we are um, following our child find obligation without, without um, concern. What had us really concerned on this chart, I'm sorry. What had... <laughs> What had us really concerned, that was an emergency, um, on, on the, the um, chart 12 was how the children were being identified. Not that they were being identified as needing IEP services or having a disability, but there mm -hmm. was something about um, following particular um, guidelines on particular disabilities. You may recall when we um, spoke last summer, when Dr. Fergus first presented some of this work, um, I spoke about the intersection of students being identified as intellectually disabled mm -hmm. and being identified as autistic, having autism. And when you look at our numbers, um, more white children are being identified by us as having autism or dyslexia 
And in three years ago and two years ago, more black children were being identified as ID. That's a big red flag for us. And that's why the, the state said to us, um, do an internal review. We went much deeper than the state directed us to do. And they said to us, if you have a reduction in disproportionality of 0.5%, point, 0 0.5, you will have you know, met the disproportionality standard. As you can say, see, we went down in that particular area over 1%. 1.25 on on the disproportionality um, data. So, so, so I have, what, I we, did not de we did not declassify the children, although some of them, you know, children should be considered that. We really looked at why were children of color being classified mm -hmm. in a particular way. And we really worked with the school psychologists to be sure we were doing the full suite of assessments so that we were picking up children that needed to be identified and we were identifying them correctly or accurately or appropriately. So, so I, I'm sorry, I'm, go ahead. So, I'm, so my question is, so was it really an, um, a focus of professional development for, for people on the staff to understand this better? Because I, I, I echo Cheryl's, you know, when uh, being a number skeptic, um, mm -hmm. it's a pretty impressive decline. And there's one way to do that. You just don't, you don't identify kids and you get your numbers fixed, right? And so you're like, exactly. I don't wanna be, I mean, I'm, I'm glad, but I also am, um, I'm, I'm, I'm leery of um, how that happened so quickly um, and, and if you can really talk about the PD that was done and, and, and was it a trend? Was it things that, you know, the, the kids were younger, there was elementary school, or they, these were high school kids who people felt were missed all along. So they jumped on getting them um, identified because they were worried that they had been neglected for so long. Can you talk a little bit more on how you think on that decline, like specifically how that decline happened? So let me just do a quick and then I'll turn yeah. it back to Stacy. Um, we've been working at this for three years. Okay. So what happened this year started in 2018-19. Okay. We looked at process and procedures. The state said do an internal um, checklist of process and procedures. There was nothing wrong with our process, with, with the board's um, policy. Um, the, it, it wasn't that. It was a PD issue and, and Stacy will talk about it. So what you're seeing in 2021 20, is, is the result of three years work, not one year. And I want to stress, it's not that these children were identified and then not identified but we directed the teams to reevaluate to see, did we miss a, a classification of learning disability or dyslexia or autism or ADHD? And did, did those, these children or the children that were reevaluated, were they not classified inappropriately as needing special education services, but not provided with the full assessment and evaluation to appropriately classify them. So Stacey, you want to talk a little bit about that PD? Can I just I jump in? I'm sorry, can I just jump in for one second, please? So here, here's my concern. It, 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 and I'm not saying this for, for, you know, whomever, but it just, what I would like to prevent is like every time we get a new superintendent, we have a new initiative. You know, some of these children, they need their services within a certain amount of time. And so if we're evaluating, we are reevaluating, we're told to do this. How do we know that children, which is the bottom line, not always the numbers, but how do we know that the children are getting the services that they need when they need them? 
that that this is a big red flag for me with um and I'm I'm sorry I can't think of another word I don't I don't want to look at a numbers game you know we're doing this so oh now we have to reevaluate but what happens in the middle or when the kids need need these services so one thing that I've I've um, sort of been asking um and 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 I'll repeat do we have a timeline for when we're testing for like is there a grade by third grade, are we testing for dyslexia? Are we testing for autism? Are we testing for hearing loss? Are we testing for whatever? So that there's a concrete timeline of when we're testing and we know that we can catch kids, um, whether whatever is the checklist, we can catch kids in time to get them the services that they need in time rather than, okay, in high school, we're finding out, oh, this person is dyslexic. They've been dyslexic all this time or you know this person has slight autism they're on the um, Asperger's um, spectrum of it I, I just I like what are we doing so again the numbers I mean if you go back to the first slide our numbers of the the, the children that we are identifying um, the not the initial referrals our total n um, our total N of disabilities has increased um, and we are identifying children um, earlier. To answer your question very directly, the I think we only gave the initial referrals. We may not have given the total N. Um, to answer your question very directly, you need to do early intervention. We need yes. to focus our SRBI process on your, you know, K through three clearly, not waiting three years. And the SRBI process that I know that Donalda will be talking about in a bit talks about um, data points, six to 12 weeks of an intervention, take weekly progress monitoring if a child is, you know, below um, our. Um, um, uh, below our, our the, tw the 25th percentile typically do those interventions, look at the weekly data. And if the progress monitoring is not showing trend, remember what I said, when there's debate, you evaluate, you refer and you evaluate. So kids are not waiting three years. Kids are getting involved in the interventions Early on, there needs to be universal screening. You mentioned hearing loss. Every child should have an audio screening. You know, that's without question. Um, in terms of early um, screening for learning disabilities, you know, we're talking about that through the SRBI process. So that, that's my response to you. It's not um, withholding referrals or not classifying children. Um, I, you know, I, I strongly urge the district to, you know, commit to the investment of that early intervention because you are correct. A child that has um, dyslexia that has been compensating for it because that child is really bright and verbal and you know all the reasons why and doesn't get picked up until middle or high school has lost an opportunity for early intervention. Mm -hmm. um, so, so what I would love to see, or in, this is probably not the time, maybe something we can think about, but it has been something that I've been concerned about since my first time on the Board of Ed is for us to set grades for which when we start to test or when we start to identify so that it's not this kind of haphazard um, way of doing it. And I don't understand why that can't be. So do we start testing, you know, for certain things like in first grade, second grade, third grade, and by third grade, if this person is in reading on reading level, do we test for X, Y, and Z? And, and so it's not done one school is doing it this way, another school is doing it that way so that it's across the board. And Donalda is, um, I don't, whoever's leading the team, that's something that we really, really need to look into. Um, I don't care what other districts are doing. I don't wanna copy other districts. I care about, I care about everybody, but I care about Norwalk students. 
And I would really love to see this in place so that if somebody does have dyslexia, if somebody does have hearing loss, the kids are not sitting there thinking something's wrong with them um, that can't be fixed earlier so that they're not having, you know, um, self-esteem issues. They're not um, being compensated incorrectly. So I think we need to have certain things in place and what are, we need to decide what are we testing for? And then when we're testing, um, you know, what, what, what measures do we have in place to help the kids, you know, to compensate for, for, whatever, for whatever the issues are. So I'm hoping that's a larger discussion that we can have so that you know, we, across the board, every school where kids are identified at this grade, they're identified at that grade, and then they're given what they need to help them. I again, I you know, I I suggest that when when the SRBI plan is implemented with fidelity and consistency across the district, and mm -hmm. the focus is on early identification and intervention, not because we want to classify kids that can benefit from three or six months of scientific research-based intervention and close a gap, but because we don't want to miss those kids. That's our child find obligation. And I hear that's what you're, you're saying. Um, and, and I believe um, that the investment in those interventionists will be the first offense to letting kids languish without the interventions that they need or waiting until middle school or fifth grade to say, oh my goodness, we missed this. How could we have missed this? Um, so I, I agree with you, Sherelle, but, um, and I also say it's the balance of providing the intervention mm -hmm. and not missing our child find obligation. That That is the balance. Suzanne asked about PD and Stacy, you wanna talk a little bit about that and then we'll wrap it up because I know you have other things on the agenda as well. Thank you. So, so I did wanna address something Suzanne brought up about the, about the numbers. And one of the things as we did go through is and the there's an alternate assessment, the Connecticut alternate assessment, and Diane's very familiar with that as well. And to qualify for that, you need to meet the same criteria as you do for um, being classified as intellectually disabled. And when we started the CTAA, um, you know, four or five years ago, we had many students with many types of disabilities. And so one of the things that we did notice and that we've been working on at the same time as working on the over identification of our black students is as Yvette spoke about earlier is that who are we giving other types of classifications to so we might have been giving a classification to a student to a student as LD, even though they meet ID criteria and the CTAA has actually helped us clean clean up our data in terms of identifying. So it wasn't just an over-identification of, of one particular subgroup. It was an over-identification of a kid here and a kid here in different other categories that were really should have been classified as ID. So we've been able to, at the same time, address that need um, through the um, alternate assessment um, criteria because to qualify for that, you need to have an intellectual disability, and there's very specific criteria. So we've been able to, through professional development, so it all leads back to that, and to work with our teams in terms of really identifying um, for a student who has an intellectual disability, there's very specific criteria. And so it has to do with IQ, it has to do with adaptive skills, both at home and at school. And so as we went through, and one of the things talking with teams is, it's not just a team and what you see at school. It also has to do with what parents are seeing at home. And we talked with them about what to do in terms of helping and supporting parents in completing the adaptive skill measures at home. 
so that we could have all three of those data points. So those three data points are required to be able to do an, an identification of a student as intellectual disabled. And what we saw through some of this was that there might not have been a home, a home survey completed. The school psychologist might have, said, might have documented in their report it was sent home and wasn't returned. But without that third piece of data, you really can't make that make that um, identification. So we've talked about different types of outreach programs to parents, how that you can ask them the questions and fill out the form and walk them through it. Um, we've now purchased some digital forms so it can be done through email so we don't have this paper packet thing going back and forth that looks really thick that you know anybody would be like, I'll get to it, I'll get to it, I'll get to it and, and not do it. So we really looked at and, and that was the going through each of these students' files to see and dig down where is that error. So then we can go back and talk with the teams um, to say, well, when we went through, we would see that, yes, there would be an IQ score, and yes, we saw something through school, but we didn't see the adaptive home. So it was really working on that full picture of what is an intellectual disability, what are the data points that have to be met, and then how are we making sure that your evaluation plans are really addressing that and working at both the home and the school environment. And so that's really that's really where we focused on. And we've been able to, you know, make sure that those families are included in this process at a much higher level. So I have two questions. Are, is any part of this done in the kindergarten registration? Any, any type of questionnaires that will indicate whether there may be a problem or not? So there are pre -K, there are pre K our um, our pre K partners um, whether it's Stepping Stones or NECC or our um, our sort of early start programs all do a childhood screener around this. Um, the challenge is that we you know we've looked at these previously in concert with those providers and have noticed that there are some very distinct cultural disconnects that sometimes over identify some groups of students and under identify others. And in the case of these intellectual disabilities that Stacy and Yvette have been speaking of, you know, so much of, of, of intellectual disabilities around IQ has to do with um, memory retrieval and, and, pre and presentation of novel situations for students um, and how they respond in those situations. And so much of home behavior is routinized so parents and kids get into routines with one another and don't kids don't necessarily you know greet a novel situation at home every day and so parents have very little to go on um, whereas teachers have experience with kids not being able to retrieve information from the day before or week before very frequently and so there is a, a bit of a disconnect that can present itself there that then leads to an identification of of a, um, a learning consideration that um, that doesn't directly align with what the child actually uh, would most benefit from getting support with. So, um, so there, there, ask this, Ronaldo. Yeah. So, are are we physically like when, when kids are when kids are? And I'm sorry, this is just very important to me because I've seen some districts do it. I've seen some private schools do it, and I just want to make sure that that we're giving everything that we can. So, are we not physically? seeing kids before they come into our district? There are a certain percentage and I could get the, I could get the percentage for you. I believe that the meeting that I had uh, on Friday was that we are preparing, for example, the Camp Ellie uh, seats. We, get, we set aside eight classrooms in Norwalk public school buildings, elementary school buildings this summer for the approximately um, 15 to 18% of incoming kindergartners that have not had any type of pre-k experience or any type of structured experience in school prior to beginning kindergarten and so those students are uh, supported through a summer kind of intensive school readiness uh, experience that will uh, sort of 
uh, you know, administer some baseline assessments and and make some noticings about them to make sure that they're on track developmentally. And when the providers uh, when the providers register the kids for those programs, they conduct a developmental inventory with the parent to see, you know, is the child um, singing multiple verses of songs? Does the child uh, recall the names of playmates and tell stories? Does the, does the child have sentences that are longer than seven words in length? Things like that. Um, right. How often does the child initiate shared attention? Um, and so uh, those are pieces that are flagged for these specific students, but we have a a little fewer than one in five of our students at this time um, receives some type of home uh, child care and does not attend pre-K. So we don't have to, because I don't want to prolong it. Maybe this is something we can talk about offline or in our next meeting. But I'm thinking if we want to be fair to all students, if we have set up like every single student that we, in this, you may say, Cheryl, that's totally outrageous. But every single student that comes into our district in kindergarten, that we have some kind of place set up where you have um, you know, certain questions or certain observations. Just say, you know, over here, this is where you know they're, they're, we're learning, you know, you know, their hearing. We're learning about um, you know, their retention over here. Maybe it's motor, gross motor skills, maybe over here, just so that we're comparing all students and we're comparing them by the same measures. And I can, I have some information on that that I can send. And I don't, I don't, you know, expect you to answer it now, but it's just a consideration so that we're not having this number, this number, we're, you know, we have 8% of the kids that are being tested, whereas this percent is not, just so we're doing things equally across the board. So that's, that's a conversation that we can have another time. Sherelle, there are states that have, I'm sorry? Sherelle, there are states that have, mandatory screenings um mm -hmm. to identify and there are some schools here that kids with suspected disabilities or suspected mm -hmm. giftedness because you don't right. you know and they're not mutually exclusive and and identifying those kids upon enrollment particularly in the early grades so um there are process and procedures and policies um, for consideration on those screenings. And before I, if, if you can just go to the last mm -hmm. slide, um, Donaldon, I thank you all for your time. So this conversation is a beginning conversation, not the end of a conversation. Um, I leave you with um, these two thoughts and one other. Um, you know the work that the district has been doing with regard to um, considerations around equity, access, and opportunity. Um, and you also know the work that will be unfolding with regard to the data teams. All of the questions that you have raised this evening as a result of our um, giving you some, some data for your consideration is, is the work of the, um, of the equity initiative and the data teams. The second that I want to share with you is um, as the district implements the SRBI policy and procedure with fidelity and consistency and coherence across the district, non-negotiable fidelity, these, the children that have the presenting concerns will be picked up earlier. It will meet not only the child find issues you are raising, but it will address gap closing more quickly so that kids don't need to be um, given an IEP to get an intervention and that we're intervening quickly and early and watching that progress. The last thing that I want to share with you that's not on the screen is that this district has invested very heavily in gold standard assessments for suspected disabilities. We have several of our psychologists involved in neuropsych programs that most districts don't have one neuropsychologist. At the end of this process, because the board supported it, you will have three or four. 
Um, we have purchased and trained on the gold standard for identifying children with dyslexia. What we have established in the literacy clinic for very high level assessments is I suggest better than what is available in most private clinics that only the wealthy can afford to access. And the district has established that and it is there as a resource for every child. The same with training our psychologists and our speech pathologists in identification, the gold standard for identification of children with autism. We've trained um, most of our staff in the ADOS and other gold standard measures. So the district is poised to do that work because you have invested in building capacity to do that work. And most districts do not have the capacity that this district has invested in over the past um, few years. So you're, you're in a good spot um, in time to address the concerns that you raised, um, Sherelle and, and Suzanne and Erica um, as a board. So, um, you know, I thank you and I thank you for the time this evening and I hope this was the beginning of a longer discussion. Thank you, Yvette, we re really appreciate the discussion. You're welcome. Thank you, Stacy. Thank you, Stacy. Thank you. Okay, so um, we kind of took up a lot of time with that, like basically our whole our whole um, hour. Um, can we, do we want to divide this into maybe put some of this on the next agenda or do we think we can maybe quickly get through this? Um, let me give you a, a very, very brief tour of what there is to offer. And what I want to suggest is that I could share the entire presentation with you all and we can talk a little further. Uh, maybe we can unpack and debrief as we go. Uh, not, I, you know, not today, because I respect, I understand about people's schedules and time, but going forward into future meetings. Uh, thank you so much, Yvette and Stacy, for being here. Thank you for your collegiality and partnership um, in every possible way. Uh, so let me see, one second. Um, back to this. So uh, share. Perfect. So, um, I, oh, I moved that up first. Wonderful. So when you all get this on your own, or if you want to convene it at a different time, I'm more than happy to, you know, be available to do that. Um, we talk a little bit about what is the- You know what, Danelda, I'm sorry. Let me just, Suzanne, um, Colin, and Erica, do you have time? I know like we had allotted till five. Are you okay on, on time? Um, do you have a hard stop? Um, I just want to be respectful of your time. Uh, I do have to jump off at five. Okay. Um, I, can, I can hang out. I could stay longer. Okay. So Colin, I guess we can bring you up to speed. I'm assuming like these, the slides that we're seeing tonight will be shared with us. Um, yeah, and then, be helpful if I can, we can get a copy of this uh, deck and um, uh, yeah, and then, you know, they can be follow-up questions, et cetera. Okay. All right. Thanks, Colin. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much, Colin. I'll, I'll email it to you right now. Thanks, Anelda. Oh, my pleasure. Of course. Okay. So I will, I'll make this, um, I will keep this uh, 30,000 feet. And if you have questions, please jump in. Um, we talked a little, we, we looked at this summer sort of what what helps a student qualify to receive summer uh, academy um, supports. And really our summer academy is a part of our tier two and tier three intervention system for students who um, are displaying some lags in their learning. And we're viewing it as an opportunity to engage kids in a really exciting and fun interdisciplinary course of study and to provide some social emotional learning supports and artistic exploration that they would have missed out on during this larger pandemic. Um, so there's a ton of enrichment built into this year's Summer Academy, but the primary reason why a child would be there is because on their beginning literacy and between grades K 
and three or um, in grades four through eight, they're really demonstrating some literacy and content mastery challenges uh, that we want to be able to attend to and give them a leg up going into the next school year. And so Sherelle had talked with me about looking at the disaggregation of data by who's, which students are identified for summer school. And, um, and when you see this, this uh, presentation in your email, in your email box, um, I urge you to just take a moment and check it out um, because there are some pieces that really jump out at our team about the way that this data fell out for students in the sense that specifically um, kids who, for example, and I talk with Sherelle about this, um, students who are face to face um, in the mode of instruction, meaning that they were in the classroom um, in grades K through five, for example, or K to eight, um, are are attending are attending summer school or recommended for summer academy at a much more significant rate than kids who were hybrid or remote. And mm -hmm. so that's an interesting um, it's an interesting piece that says you know the way that we formatted hybrid instruction for students this year by having specific students um, be very close to their teacher their faces were right in line with their teacher as the teacher was teaching. Meanwhile, other students were in their classrooms or behind a screen within the classroom, but not necessarily interacting with peers, received less of a benefit um, from being a fully in present just due to the mode of instruction and the way that instruction is delivered. So it's something that we can, we can look closely at. Also, we noticed that we have um, a pretty significant portion of multilingual students in our uh, in our qualifying summer group, um, meaning that you know the summer tools that we select um, in terms of the curriculum sequence in English and mathematics, as well as um, the strategic research based interventions that we weave in, have to honor that many of these students are potentially emerging bilinguals or multilingual learners, and that they're acquiring English, and so sometimes the curricula needs to be available in another language. Um, and other times uh, we need to make sure that there are very uh, explicit language scaffolds in place uh, to support those, those students. Um, we see that uh, students who qualify for free and reduced price lunch are also pretty significantly represented here, which is an aspect of, you know, there are lots of causal factors around overlapping hardships and kids academic success, um, we can most pointedly draw to the hardships, of, draw a line to the hardships of COVID, but this also could have to do with um, specific developmental experiences and background knowledge schema that we want to build for students and give them increased access to, um, the building of vocabulary, the, the sharing of lots of rich experiences. So I can share a little bit about our summer school plan later uh, in this a overview that can give you a taste of what we have in mind to, to help these students move ahead. Um, let's see. There is an update on our strategic research based intervention programming. Um, as I mentioned previously, the way we're conceptualizing Summer Academy is that building around the five pillars of reading, which are highlighted here in bold, fluency, comprehension, phonemic awareness, phonics, and vocabulary. We've strategically selected three uh, strategic based, strategic research based interventions that we're going to train paras, paraprofessionals, and teachers to administer in an instructional model this summer that makes sure that kids who have identified needs in any of these areas receive that type of foundational support to help them move forward. And in the 2021 school year, moving into the fall, we will have a very large cohort of people who are trained in these specific interventions, Great Leaps, Hagerty, Hagerty Bridge the Gap for Middle School, Inspire, and our math version, which is Bridges Intervention, um, in the 2021 school year, we'll have our SRBI teams that are in place in schools. And Yvette talked a bit about the data teamwork, but there will be hiring of an SRBI director. Uh, we referred two candidates that were both really strong to Dr. Estrella a few weeks ago for her consideration, uh, Yvette, Stacy, and myself, and along with a hiring team. There will be reading and writing improvement teachers and mathematics improvement teachers in each school next year, K-8, to and instructional coaches for all K-8 to schools. So th these 
personnel will receive some specific training that allows them to monitor the progress of students as they go and make it so that a child doesn't need an IEP to have an interaction with a, with a program like this that could support them. And then in next year's academic program, the implementation of a daily SRBI period uh, that is 30 or 40 minutes in length to support the academic and enrichment sequence for all students in grades K to eight. So students will, on a rotating basis of six to eight weeks, encounter a SRBI uh, focused uh, intervention or an enrichment activity that um, that will support their ongoing learning. Um, is it okay if I if I keep going? I have a logistic question. How how are, are you doing with being able to staff um, to staff the summer academy? Because some of the schools that I work with are really having a hard time with teachers who have had COVID burnout. They're having a hard time staffing their summer schools. That's a really good point and something that we devote a, devoted a significant amount of, of attention to over the past few weeks. Okay. We are finding that our summer staff, well, I've been told, and Janine can second this, that Norwalk pays extraordinarily well in terms of a summer rate. And so that's great because we have a lot of returning teachers uh, who are invested and want to continue with the program. We are going to have to look to external candidates for between 10 and 20% of our positions this year. Um, so far, uh, that's, that's the trend that we're seeing, particularly for the special education positions because folks are completely fried. It's true. So a big piece of this is, is figuring out how can the program be restorative and engaging, uh, you know, intellectually and in real life for the adults as well. Mm -hmm. You know, how can we skill people up in, a, in an environment uh, that's a return to school scenario? Uh, how can we make it fun? How can we set aside time for um, enrichment, social emotional learning, some mindfulness, um, lots of outdoor activity and lots of museum uh, education type you know, virtual field trips and regular field trips to the aquarium or to the Mystic Seaport Museum or other places in Norwalk. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been trying to share with teachers that they'll get a special opportunity to be in professional community around new topics of learning, as well as um, we want it to be fun for kids. Right. So that's been, that's been pretty attractive to people so far, but next month we'll have a much more, um, We'll have a, we'll have very hard data around exactly how many spots we still need to fill. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, so Nelda, can, yes. can I ask the SRBI period? How is that fitting into the day? Like what drops to allow that to come in? So the there there isn't a swapping out. There's more of a I think a tightening up of time and a um, a systematizing of the way that programming happens specifically in K to five to allow this to happen. So we know that, for example, the literacy blocks are going to be synced up across all schools to be between 90 and 120 minutes on varying days. And the math blocks will be between 75 and 90 minutes on varying days. Um, the science and so the teaching of science and social studies will be prioritized. Uh, there will be a recess period uh, and, a, and a lunch period, for example. And the, the SRBI period is going to be, uh, it's programmed right now to be 30 minutes um, across uh, in the lower grades, K to two, all at the same time so that it's possible to uh, have some strategic regrouping of students and then a three to five block at another time of day to be able to uh, strategically regroup those students across grade if necessary. Uh, there hasn't, it isn't uh, as much of a, of a cut or a swapping out of anything as much as it is a sort of systematizing and um, a, more, a more coherent um, kind of unified approach to scheduling and supervision of instructional time. So, for example, um, when I first came to Norwalk a few months ago, what I really noticed going from classroom to classroom was that math, if I would look at the teacher's flow of the day, I would always notice that math was taught between 2 and 3 p.m. And teachers, for whatever reason, were saving math until the very end of the day in elementary school. 
Um, and it, it, it made sense to me to know that maybe that's because teachers are less familiar with the content or less familiar with the pedagogy or whatever with, within the elementary grades. And so one, you know, that signals a need for a little bit of additional professional support, but also a communication around how important it is to alternate uh, the teaching of topics. Uh, for students, uh, you know, just to kind of keep the instructional routine lively and brisk, but also to give kids different opportunities to explore in elementary grades center time with different, you know, uh, with diff in different content areas and with different projects and and focus so, or, or foci. So um, a bit of this is is looking at the way that teachers um, and school leaders are uh, prioritizing instructional time and what happens during specific instructional blocks and then helping taking an inquiry approach around what would be uh, a way that we could guarantee a viable curriculum for all our students and give everyone the exposure to the units of study that we think are most important and really concentrate on priority standards uh, that are highest uh, highest leverage for kids learning uh, across our schools so that we don't have so much um, sort of independent uh, uh, decision making at the classroom level and really allowing uh, kids to be able to um, and parents to know that children are getting an, an education that is of high quality that's being closely sort of um, monitored and supported in all of our school buildings, uh, regardless of students, you know, identification of disability, uh, their the home language they speak, the socioeconomic status of parents, their background knowledge, etc. We can control for as much uh, as possible by being unified in our instructional approach. And that's where that kind of line of thinking comes from. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit more about illustrative math because this was a big piece that Sherelle asked for us to put together. I think that it may be uh, a good idea if we were to um, table this particular part of our presentation for the next curriculum meeting. And I defer to Sherelle on this. I'm happy, Tina and I are happy to talk about why illustrative math for this particular point in time is a really, um, is, is, is really strong for us here in COVID and what the design principles are uh, of the program and why um, it supports the unfinished learning work and helps us identify priority standards, but also helps us program into this center-based instruction approach that has kids doing so much more hands-on learning than they would have the opportunity to do in a typical math sequence. Um, so I will share this presentation and you all can take a look at it and then we can talk about it in the future. Um, the, the last piece, which I asked Sherelle if we could add just because I'm so proud of it, um, is our um, Mystic Seaport Partnership for kids in grades four through eight. And so much of the work that we're doing this year is really trying to showcase um, the identities of students and their families um, and their their ethnic heritage or racial heritage in ways that um, we don't typically see covered in history. So we've worked closely with the museum educators at the Mystic Seaport Museum to um, come up with social studies and science integration projects that students will do. Um, museum educators will visit schools. There will be virtual field trips for students every week and twice each fourth through eighth grader will visit the Mystic Seaport Museum and do a social studies integration activity or a science integration activity. And these are really kind of brilliant and inspirational the way that they're designed. Um, there's, uh, you know, the kids are studying oral histories. Um, they're looking at the context of life in this area for families and, you know, seafaring um, professionals. Uh, from hundreds of years ago, they're they're um, they're getting on boats. Uh, they're looking at the night sky. They're studying the interdisciplinary connections of history. This eighth grade one is particularly inspiring because there's so much. There's an integrated planetarium show um, around what it would have felt like for a, a member of the Amistad, for example, to be repatriated to Sierra Leone after such a long and incredibly arduous battle within the United States, just earning the right um, in our justice system 
to to go back home after being the passenger um, you know, on a slave ship and being considered um, neither slave nor free for well over a decade. Finally, these folks get to go home and we get to integrate um, this, their, the story of their struggle and triumph with our own American history and international history and seafaring history and looking at the, the science connections of what it would have been, what that experience would have been like for those folks. Um, and this is the, the global, uh, you know, set of um, educational experiences that kids in grades four through eight will have completely um, connected to, but outside their literacy and mathematics program that the, um, the Mystic Seaport folks have designed for, for our students. And the, it, it includes some uh, family engagement virtual programs. Uh, and this one here is really exciting. Uh, it, there's a lot of engineering uh, sta learning standards built into this work um, where they're looking um, beyond um, oceanography and oceaneering and, and um, maritime work and looking into space and the um, and spacecraft mission. So like all of these pieces are sort of like, what is the next frontier for, for people? And how can we help acquaint students with a with a future and a um, and a world that they don't they don't yet know about? But how can we give them the tools to explore it? So I'll send the presentation to you all so that you can take a look and we can talk a little bit more deeply about it the next time we get together. Uh, I want to thank Sherelle so much for being such an incredible partner and um, brainstorming these topics for us, and invite you all to please. You know, let us know uh, what you'd like to talk about. The, just finally, the pre-K um, component, identification component, and the way that we welcome students into the school system is of particular interest to our team. And we do have global data uh, from a tool called the, the PELI, um, which yeah. is a pre-K um, early learning instrument that all of our students are assessed on. And we have some data for that uh, that we could share next time if that's of interest to you. Um, for all students who enter kindergarten in Norwalk, whether they were with home care providers, their own parents, or in a pre-K or preschool program. Is the Ellie program still going on? Yes, it is. Ellie is the our Ellie, okay. fantastic partner. They do such an extraordinary job, and they are the folks who are running those eight classrooms this summer to have kids who have never participated in a pre-K or preschool experience before to get them ready for their kindergarten experience. They're going to be at four separate schools. Uh, we just gave them the classrooms today. Um, Cranberry, Kendall, Tracy, and Brookside. Got it. Okay. So Suzanne and Erica, if you don't mind, um, I think we can look at number three next time. Um, definitely number six, I'd like to dive into that. Um, and number five, are you okay with that? Three, five, and six? Um, yes. Talking about that next time? Yes. And then I normally um, would do like a call, like before we have our meetings, um, at least two or three weeks, do a call. Like, so if there's anything you guys are interested in, um, we can, I think I mentioned that during my, in my last email that we can do that. So um, I want to thank everyone. I know the special ed um, is near and dear to my heart because I just think we can catch students earlier and get them on the right track um, a lot earlier. So um, I just want to thank everyone. I know Yvette is gone and Stacy um, are gone, but thank you as well, Donalda. And if you're okay, Donalda, with three, five, and six, um, just doing a deeper dive into those um, during our next meeting. Sure. That's okay. All yeah, right. looking. I'm I'm looking forward to it tremendously. I think that they, the SRBI work especially is uh, is really crucial and would change so much. Um, for our for our educators and our students. Okay. Yeah. And Erica, I'm hoping you and I can have a conversation because I, I, I think we took up a lot of this, which I'm really happy that we did with, with special ed, but whether how whose agenda we want to put like child fine and SRBI on. So maybe you and I can have that conversation. Absolutely.
Okay. Um, so and, I'll, I'll call for motion. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, because I, I was just pulling up my agenda because it was someplace I wanted because I want to be sure to hear more about the math program. But that's six. Yeah. We already got us yeah. well. I'm very interested to hear about um, the illustri math. Yeah. Me too, Suzanne. <laughs> <laughs> I know, okay. Sherelle, you've been, you have been, uh, you've been, you have been putting that on the agenda for a while and it just, it just blazed over. I know. And but the conversation was, it was so phenomenal and I think we needed to have that. And the child fine is something that I have to dig a little bit deeper into. So maybe we'll put illustrative math number one um, <laughs> okay. for next sounds time. Good. That sounds great. They're all yeah. important. They're all important. I think. All right. It was an important conversation today. I, I, was, are. I just was quickly looking to be sure that, that which I would, didn't know what three, five, and six were, but we are all covered with six. So thank you for that. <laughs> That's right. I think um, what Tina, that said about tell Tina, 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 Tina woohoo back to you. She just put woohoo in the comment section. Oh, so yeah, woohoo back yeah, to she's, you. She's, so we're, she's we're ready. ready. What, what did that said about yeah. the referral rates going up um, in the last two months of the year is very, is very, that's true. That's real. Um, because what's happening now is um, principals are emailing and checking in to say, you know, I have these six students and they haven't made any progress all year. And I think that we should, you know, look into retaining them because they're in grades one through three and they're in the bottom 10th percentile of literacy for, you know, kids nationally and in their grade and in Norwalk. And you know we've had conversations um, on the phone with them, and I have convened meetings with Stacy Avet, myself, the principal, and and you know usually the CISD, and looked over the data. And in some cases, the principals say, well, you know, the kids' attendance is really spotty. But let's be clear: if a kid is in the you know third percentile of their literacy um, all all school year, even with a 60% attendance rate that we, it scream, it cries out for, for more diagnostic testing. And that's something that we, you know, it, we, it, that isn't a May through June experience. That's really something that if we can acculturate people to knowing and being empowered to do much sooner, we can really step in and save kids. Um, so many months and years of hardship and struggle and identity issues. And so I'm really grateful for your attention on this because our um, early warning system uh, needs to, that alarm needs to get louder and louder until it is completely mm -hmm. impossible to ignore and must be addressed immediately. It's not about holding the child over and thinking that, you know, um, if the child acquires more English, then they will be, um, you know, better able to demonstrate um, awareness of phonemes. Uh, like, the most phonemic language in the world is Spanish. We pronounce every single letter. So the idea that that that's the that's the piece that's a struggle is not. It doesn't hold water, right? So a lot of those numbers for referrals may you know may end up in the next two months. But as we enter as we implement an SRBI system with uh, with data measures and benchmarks that we. Um, can you know look into across schools and see how kids are really doing, uh, and and norm that data with other districts that have implemented and the the program data as provided. Uh, we'll be able to track our progress far more effectively than we are right now, and that requires you know the attention of special education service provision, of course, but also curriculum because so much of this. Uh, type of work has a place in the classroom every day, right? So that's that's my uh, stump speech for today. Um, and I'm really grateful to work with you all. And thank you for nodding your heads because I know yes. <laughs> anybody because you see the kiddos that really want to read and succeed and and you know for whatever reason are facing barriers. Mm -hmm. So yeah, amen. Yeah, I you know Cheryl, as you were talking. Um, you know, what helps me sleep at night is I think Dr. Estrella and Donalda, you know, they immediately identified these things and worked them into the budget and help is coming, you know, <laughs> we're getting there. Yeah. I agree. So um, we'll just keep at it and keep um, sounding those alarms a little louder and louder. So, 
All right, so I will call for a motion to adjourn. Erica? Second. Do you have a second? Suzanne? All in favor? Aye. Aye. So we'll adjourn at, uh, looks like it's 527. And then I'll see you guys at, at seven. We sure will. Thanks to the team for putting the data together and helping so much always. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have you. a wonderful, have a wonderful couple of hours. See you all later tonight. Okay. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye.